Welcome to Conservation Cafe, Take Action with ANS Advocates. And um, we have a small crowd tonight, but we're really excited for those who will join us later on to watch the recording and uh, get a sense of what we're up to, up to the minute right now with the advocacy program at Audubon Naturalist Society. We're gonna have action alerts that you can do. We're gonna put the links in the chat and you can take action on some petitions and write some letters to elected officials. Right now, tonight, some of them are such new campaigns that they, the only email alert action went out for them yesterday. Um, you know, so you're, you're, getting, you're getting it straight from the horse's mouths here. Uh, and we're really excited to be with you. Um, the, our mission is to inspire residents of the greater Washington DC region to appreciate, understand, and protect their natural environment through outdoor experiences, education, and advocacy. And our vision, which is really important part of the work we do with the conservation program and the organization for all, says that we seek to create a larger and more diverse community of people who treasure the natural world and work to protect, to preserve it. So we are, are working on the natural world and we're also working with and for people. And that, that's pretty important um, to us over the last few years. And we're gonna tell you a little bit more about how that's played out in our work. Um, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Eliza Kaba. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Director of Conservation at Audubon Naturalist Society. I'm closing right in on five years with ANS and it's my favorite job. Um, that I've ever had. And I enjoy leading the department and uh, managing my team and contributing to the growth and strategic vision of ANS. Um, advocacy is where um, my immediate background was prior to coming to ANS, but I also worked in environmental education. So I love that in my role, I get to kind of unify a lot of elements of my professional and personal backgrounds and passions. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Ari to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ari Eisenstadt. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm the DC conservation advocate for ANS. And I'm very lucky to, to work under a fantastic boss, Liza. Um, and if you're on social media, feel free to tweet me. I don't, I don't tweet very much, but <laughs> if, if you tweet me, I'll try to respond. Um, so I, I work on issues specific to DC, but that are very similar throughout the, the region. Uh, on climate policy, environmental justice, and water quality. And my background is in uh, geology and chemical oceanography, so a bunch of greenhouse gases and things. Um, but I also used to be a teacher um, for third grade students through AmeriCorps. So I love my work here, and I'm really excited to tell you a little more about it. And um, as Eliza mentioned, we, we have a whole conservation team. I am but one of a group of three advocates. My um, peers are Denise and Renee. Denise is our Maryland conservation advocate and Renee is our Northern Virginia conservation advocate. And both of them focus on some of the same things that I do in terms of climate change, sustainability, water quality, um, just in their specific jurisdictions and Denise mainly focuses on Montgomery County and Renee mainly focuses on Fairfax County with a little bit of Loudoun and Prince William and other things thrown in there and they're amazing. I'm extremely lucky to have them as um, you know teammates of mine and they're both off doing amazing things as Eliza mentioned. So. Okay I'm going to take it back over and tell you about our new conservation priorities. So um, last year, beginning in the fall of 2019, we actually received a transformative gift, um, and we have a little bit about this on our blog, um, to allow us to expand the, it was the fall of 2018 we received the gift to expand the advocacy team to hire our three new advocates. Prior to that, we only had one part-time advocate in Northern Virginia and myself. So we really, really expanded our capacity with a specific focus to work, work on climate change. But after the advocates had been at it for a couple of months, we realized, um, that we needed to assess kind of what our strategic direction was. So, you know, and wasn't something that we had considered in our strategic plan, even just two years before um, in any depth uh, because it wasn't part of our historic portfolio. So we created a task force that included board members, staff, uh, regular members and um, outside partners and colleagues who we work with in coalition that met for several months and we developed a new set of conservation priorities that are um, four of them and they're equal um, in the weight that we give them and the time and uh, the time that we spend with them. But most of the issues we actually work on cross at least two, if not all four of them. 
So the conservation priorities that we work on are human health and access to nature. As I said, we really do have a focus on humans. And this is where we think about who has, as an environmental justice matter, access to nature, who has a healthy environment that they can interact with, who has the ability to even recognize the relationship between a healthy environment and a healthy human habitat. Um, so these are all really important um, parts of the work that we do in conservation, both in our advocacy and in our outreach. Um, also extremely important, of course, is biodiversity and habitats. And we spend an awful lot of time with the, with the, little, with the little things, the, the small chunks of habitat interspersed around our urban and suburban places. And we try to think region wide, how do we preserve the most remaining biodiversity and habitat in our region as it's as developed as it is and as it continues to have new population growth of people. Um, so we try to think really as strategically and creatively as we can to make sure that we're being, um, we're maximizing our effectiveness in protecting biodiversity and habitats as the region just continues to undergo such rapid change. It's a really challenging space uh, for this. Um, and then of course the climate crisis, we'll talk more about this later, um, but we are working on local, uh, local elements, local angles to the climate crisis. We're not doing national legislation or advocacy. We're really focusing on what our local counties and city jurisdictions can do, both on mitigation, which is reducing the impacts of, reducing how bad climate and adaptation, which is the fact that we have climate change means we need to deal with it. So how do we deal with it, both for human and natural environments? And then sustainable land use, which is often the key that unlocks all three of the others when, in terms of where we live or where, how we move around, um, the kinds of buildings that we're allowed to build in different places, the places that we preserve, that's all about land use planning. And so we spend um, uh, a lot of time on land use planning as a way to get at the other three pretty frequently. And now Ari's gonna talk to us a little bit more about uh, how we, what the climate change issues are locally. Yeah, thanks Eliza. This is just a little snapshot of DC's greenhouse gas emissions sector. Oh, excuse me, actually the DC area. Um, it's a little bit different in, in DC specifically, but um, as is the case throughout the rest of the country, you know, one of the biggest sources um, and you know, nationwide, the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions is transportation. Um, and that includes you know, our own vehicles, but it also includes things like shipping. Um, and then the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions is buildings and that's where land use comes in and so this you know chart helps explain a little bit of why we focus on the things that we focus on and what ties land use into you know sustainability and climate change and the importance of you know talking about all of these things as a holistic picture um, and you'll get to hear a little bit more about how this feeds into the specific campaign work that we do but you know, we kind of look at, at everything through, all right, is this going to help reduce emissions or mitigate climate change in some way? Is this going to help people? Is this going to help nature? So next slide. Yeah, and I wanted to add one thing Ari said, um, working on buildings links to land use. It also links to actual buildings. So energy use in buildings, the types of energy that buildings use. Ari's gonna talk a little bit more about that later, but I wanted to say it's, it's where the buildings are and it's actually like what the buildings are made of and how we heat and we cool them is huge sources of emissions in our region, especially with the, when you think about the temperature swings we get that we need both heating and cooling, you know, in different times of the year. Um, we're gonna do one more slide and then actually I think we should take a question break before we get into the specific campaigns. So we're going through our sort of general overview of what we do for advocacy and then we're gonna start talking about the campaigns. So one more slide that I'll take over, which is we've talked about the why, now we're gonna talk about the, um, the how. So the how we conserve is another strategic element we put together um, in the past few years. We actually did it before we did the conservation priorities, but we've, we've kept these, these tactics um, the same for several years now. So we think about both a healthy environment and healthy people, and we have different tools in our toolkit to do that. So we do do policy and advocacy, and we're gonna talk to you in detail about, about what that looks like. Um, we testify, we testify virtually, we used to testify in person, we rally, we write letters, we have meetings with elected officials and agency officials. We come up with coalitions that we either join or lead to brainstorm, what should we do next on this issue? How do we bring a bill forward? Who's gonna be our champion? Who do we have to twist their arm and how do, you know, and who has the leverage to twist their arm? 
So we kind of do some traditional, both kind of a little bit of insidery and also some outsidery advocacy. By, and then when I say outsidery, I mean, um, you know, trying to get people to send letters and, and stomp and shout at rallies. But, and then the insidery is like having meetings. Um, but then we also do community engagement, training and organizing. And we, this gives us some real basis of legitimacy, especially when we make coalitions. So we, we are out in communities, not every community, we, there's not that many of us, but we've made some partnerships with specific communities around the DC region, many of whom are really underrepresented in their ability to speak about land use policy and environmental policy in their, in their neighborhoods. And so we, we go and we do fun things with them and we walk them into watersheds and we ask them what's important to them about the resources in their community. Uh, we play uh, games with kids, we do workshops with adults and um, we draw on ANS's other expertises in environmental education to help us do this. And then as we meet these communities and we meet their leaders, we begin to work together on coalitions and advocacy needs that in some cases are new to us. Some of these partnerships have redirected some of ANS's historic advocacy priorities. In other cases, they've just allowed us to broaden where we can work on really cool conserving biodiversity in an effective, strict, you know, strong way. Um, because we just previously didn't know that much about a, you know, a particular uh, park land uh, because we just hadn't gone there very much. It's on the other side of the region from our headquarters. So the two community engagement, training and organizing and policy advocacy really feed on each other. Uh, and our partners recognize that as something that we do well um, and uniquely. Um, I'll, I'll say that there's a trade-off. We are not the, we're not gonna write the legislation. We don't have any lawyers. You know, so there are some things our partners are not going to ever count on us to do, and that's just fine. What they will count on us to do, and that we do really well, is bringing coalitions together with new and diverse voices to work on this whole spectrum of issues. So I wanted to stop sharing there, and um, you're welcome to use the chat or the Q and A, uh, and just ask folks if you have some um, if you have some questions. Is there anybody wants to ask so far? We've got one in the Q and A already. Okay, Ari, can you do that? A-F-O-L-U? Yes, that's agriculture, forestry, and other land use. Good job. So that means chopping down trees, you know, using land for farming, and that's a whole other complicated thing that we're dealing with a little bit in Maryland, actually. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of carbon that gets stored in trees, and so when you chop trees down, that ends up releasing carbon into the atmosphere when it degrades. And so that's, sure that's just a, that. thank you. That's just a little piece of that. Um, and yeah, the process and fugitive emissions. Um, I'll, I'll focus first, I guess, on the fugitive emissions in particular. And um, we're working on the issue of fugitive emissions in DC it's specifically because fugitive emissions are emissions that, that leak basically from anywhere in the, the supply chain from the place where um, you know oil or natural gas is produced to when it ultimately ends up in your in your home. It's stuff that kind of seeps through the cracks, so to speak, sometimes literally the cracks in the pipes. Um, and so we have to account for that even if we don't end up ultimately being able to use that. Um, and then process emissions is also, you know, the emissions when you're at the site, you know, doing the hydraulic fracturing, gathering the gas, for example, or, you know, gathering the oil from deep in the earth. Um, yeah, and then let me see if I've got everything in there. Ah, and wastewater. Um, that's an, a really interesting question. Um, and I know at, at first you might think that it's from, you know, smelly, smelly poop, but actually it's because of the energy that it takes to process wastewater um, and water in general, the energy it takes to process it, clean it, put it back where, you know, where it should be in rivers and streams. Um, and it's a really interesting situation in DC because the city's well, wastewater treatment plant is called Blue Plains and it's in Southeast DC. And I think it's actually the biggest wastewater treatment plant in the country. Um, it's definitely the most advanced. Who knows whether it's yeah. the biggest by size, but it's the it takes the most nutrients out of the water of any other in the country. Yeah, and that uses a lot of energy and energy ultimately because our grid isn't super clean yet, um, the energy comes from 
power plants that burn gas and oil and fossil fuels to basically spin these big turbines that move electrons around. And then the electrons get pushed into our wires and sent to places that use electricity, like wastewater treatment plants. Did that clarify things? She responded in the chat already. Oh, she, oh it was very clarifying. So thanks, Ari. Great, yeah. Great answer. Um, and we have another question, which uh, I'll, I'll do for Margaret. I'm a beekeeper and a lifelong birder and climate watcher. What is the intersection of beekeeping and ANS? That's not something we're going to speak to in detail tonight, but um, it is a great question. And it's something that uh, probably the easiest way to see how ANS um, works on bees. I wouldn't say beekeeping, actually. I, I'm not sure that there's much of a, of a sort of beekeeping relationship with ANS, but in terms of native bees, um, we really, really promote native landscapes. Um, we do so in some of our advocacy and outreach work, and we are doing a lot at our sanctuary. So we are, as we restore our sanctuary through the Nature for All project, um, both our forest and our meadows, we are making videos, doing promotions, doing tours to try to make sure that people understand the value of the native plants for native pollinators. Um, and we're using that as part of our educational outreach. So people can come and look at our native meadows anytime and we do tours um, and educational programs about them. So I think that's, I hope that answers your question, Margaret. I don't, I don't have any particular answer on beekeeping itself. Um, uh, other than of course, if the question comes up, you know, we support the uh, uh, campaigns to, you know, reduce overspray of pesticides and things like that. Um, neonicotinoids, that sort of thing. Any other questions on some, some of these big picture issues? I had a question just because we talked about, I have another question, but because of the sewer question, does DC have like a consistent problem with like, um, like combined sewer overflow or like things going wrong, like with too much rain or something like that? We just got news today. Are you wanna, <laughs> did you see that email? <laughs> I didn't see it yet, um, but there's always a lot of, um, yes, that, that's okay. a big, that's like one of the, I think like long, longest standing issues that, mm -hmm. that ANS has worked on in, in the region, if not in DC. Um, but yeah, there's combined sewer overflows all the time. They're less frequent than they used to be, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and I'll back up a little bit for folks who may not be familiar with combined sewer overflows. I know I wasn't particularly before I started this job. Um, but in certain areas of the city and in, in any city, there, there's two different types of sewer systems, basically. Um, there's a storm sewer system, which takes water and all sorts of stuff that runs off from, you know, paved surfaces and it goes into, on the side of the road, they're called catch basins. So it's those little slots right between the uh, end of the street and the curb. And in areas with um, what's called a separate sewer system, you get the storm water that goes from those pipes in those areas that goes directly into waterways, um, into streams, into rivers. There we go. Thank you. Um, and it doesn't get treated. Basically, it doesn't go to a wastewater treatment plant. So anything that gets carried into the sewers with that water when it rains, for example, or even when you know you, you pour something on the on the sidewalk, um, that goes into rivers and streams too, or the ocean, depending on where you are in the country. Um, and then in that same system, there's a separate set of pipes for sewage, for for waste from households, from buildings, and that doesn't connect to the same set of pipes that stormwater does in this separate sewer system. That ends up going directly all all the um, all the waste goes directly to a wastewater treatment plant. And then it gets filtered and cleaned a lot. Um, and then ultimately ends up getting put back into water waste. But in um, many jurisdictions in DC included, there's what's called a combined sewer system, which means that uh, stormwater and stuff from the street, rain, et cetera, gets you know, funneled into the same set of pipes that waste does. Um, and, you know, that means that everything then gets, you know, put into the wastewater treatment plant system 
and filtered. So stormwater gets filtered as well, which you know, theoretically is a fantastic thing. We certainly don't want water that contains you know, stuff like oil from cars to end up in our waterways before getting treated. But what happens is that because stormwater is in those same pipes with all the sewage, you can't really separate them. And when it rains really, really hard, sometimes there's too much water for that system to be able to hold. And in order to make sure that sewage doesn't then back up into our basements, um, which used to be a, a big problem, and, and I grew up in New York City, it's happened to my family. Um, and yeah, in order to make sure that sewage doesn't then back up into your basement, there's a safety mechanism in, in the sewer system. So there's this little levee. And if the water level gets too high, yeah, Eliza's pointing to it, thank you. If the water level gets too high, so basically if there's too much combined volume from wastewater and stormwater, then there's an extra space for this volume to flow out of instead of either, you know, it can't flow to the wastewater treatment plant quickly enough, essentially, which means that it ends up going directly over that levee into rivers and streams without being treated. Um, and so that means we get a lot of raw sewage in our waterways and raw sewage contains many, many things that we don't want in our waterways, um, not just for humans, but also for wildlife. And one of the biggest things and the things that we, that we monitor um, through some of our bacteria monitoring programs are E. coli. Um, and so DC, I'm not sure what the situation is in Montgomery and Fairfax counties, but DC is uh, actually has a ban on, on swimming or, or wading or basically interacting, <laughs> um, except for from a, from a boat with any of the waterways. So it's actually illegal to go swimming, which is quite a sad thing if you think about it. But to answer your question, uh, Christian, we have a lot of combined sewer overflows. Yeah. DC and Alexandria, there is an older model. And older cities on the East Coast are far more likely to have combined sewers than um, the newer cities built after, I don't know, the middle of the 20th century. Um, all right, let's let's dive into some of what we some of some of our other specific campaigns. And as you can see, we do lots and lots of different kinds. We're not talking about all of them tonight. We get to some. Um, so uh, uh, here we go, Maryland. Let me let me share screen again. And if you have questions in the meantime, please use the chat or the Q and A. Either is fine. And we'll take another. Um, we'll take some more question pauses later on. So in Maryland, and again, I'm representing Denise Gitar, our Maryland conservation advocate, who's not here tonight because she's testifying on one of the items I'll be telling you about. We do, as Ari said, most of our work in Montgomery County, a little bit in Prince George's County, and a certain amount at the state level uh, with the Maryland General Assembly and with the Maryland Department of the Environment uh, to advocate with, with them for various things. So two things we're going to tell you about tonight. One is the biggest news in the region is fighting the Beltway and I-270 expansion. And we have a real action alert ready for you, which is, um, I'm going to back up. We've been fighting the Beltway and 270, I-270 expansion since about 20, well, since 2019. Governor Hogan first introduced the idea at the end of 2017. It sort of seemed like a little bit of a, well, that's a nice idea, kind of fantasy. It didn't go anywhere for a long time. But in 2019, as it, as it started revving up, that it, they were really moving and actually working on it, we began um, much more engaged and have been continuously ever since. And we work in a coalition called the Maryland Advocates for Sustainable Transportation with many groups across the state, um, the, including the Sierra Club and the Coalition for Smarter Growth and many others. Um, and we're not interested in any lane expansion on the Beltway and I-270, and here's why. More pavement means more stormwater runoff, means more trees cut down, um, more lanes for cars doesn't mean less cars on the road or less traffic. It just means that the cars that pay to get in the hot lane will be able to go faster. Everybody else is still stuck there. And there's a, a phenomenon called induced demand that um, has been shown many times around the country and probably around the world, although I'm less certain about that, that when you build more capacity for cars, it might help with traffic for just a little while. And then new subdivisions spring up to take advantage of that commuting capacity and getting to downtown quicker. And then the road lanes just fill back up again. Um, and so that's not good for climate change with all those more cars on the road. And what we really want to see instead, and what, again, we work um, a lot with the Maryland General Assembly on, is but much better public transportation. Maryland has quite a, quite a great MARC train network, actually. 
And it could be better. There could be more routes or more extensions, but the rails already exist. The cars already exist. They really just need budget to run it more frequently and have it be a real transit system instead of just a rush hour commuter system. But that could, you know, imagine what that could do to take traffic off the road if Mark was more, uh, more effective and reliable. It's not very reliable. So if, if any of you are familiar with it, you know that um, it's, it's hard for people to plan their commutes around Mark because it can run, they could just skip a train and then you're 40 minutes late. Um, so the, the action alert, Ari, have you dropped it in the chat? On the Beltway and I-270 expansion is to, um, is to fight it and ask the Board of Public Works, which is a three person panel consisting of Governor Hogan, Comptroller Peter Franchot, and Treasurer Nancy Kopp, that the three of them have enormous power to move this big contract forward. And um, they're meeting probably next month, about 25 days from now, because about five, last week, a, a, another vote took place in Maryland um, Department of Transportation that it, then it enables the Board of Public Works to move ahead. But, but yesterday, this other obscure government body, the Transportation Planning Board of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments took it off their long range plan. And without it being on the long range plan, it's gonna be much harder to get federal support and approval. So I, it's hard for me to understand exactly what's happening next. I don't think that has actually killed the project, but it is the biggest roadblock we've seen so far. And it was a surprise. I, I certainly didn't know it was coming. I don't know, very few advocates, I think knew it was coming, um, but Mark Elrich is, County Executive Mark Elrich is representative to the Transportation Planning Board made this motion and it passed. So um, that's fantastic news, but that we, we gotta put the nails in the coffin. Uh, so please, Go to that action alert uh, that Ari just submitted, put in the chat and send a letter to the Board of Public Works telling them not to move forward with any contracts until we actually know the full environmental impact of the I-270 expansion because they, um, they committed a year ago to not moving forward with any contracts until the environmental impact studies are done and they are not doing that. They want to move forward with contracts even though we're still waiting on the full environmental studies. So that's action alert number one. And I can try to answer questions about it, but like I said, we're still working out the implications of what yesterday's vote was. Next item. So Thrive 2050. Thrive 2050 is the update to Montgomery County's general plan, which hasn't been updated, I think since the 60s or 70s even, um, when it was last, with a really major general major update called on wedges and corridors. We're a little late um, to do the update, but Thrive 2050 envisions the next 30 years of the county's future, um, what it will look like. And it's meant to kind of encompass everything. And the structure of government that is putting this together is the planning board supported by their planning staff. Um, Maryland has very, very robust um, planning as a profession and as a part of government. In this case, the planning boards are actually state employees of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. And they, um, they have a lot of, of authority over land use, although they don't, the council still has to approve. So they kind of function as an agency that makes the analysis and recommendations to the council and the council votes to approve or can make up their own amendments as well. Um, so the professional planners and then the appointed and elected um, planning commissioners guide the work of the planning department in Montgomery County and the same in Prince George's County. And they're responsible for analyzing and coming up with what are the right plans? What kind of growth you know, can go where? What, how, what do we need to sustain the people? What do we need to sustain the resources? Where should transportation go in the future? You know, and at this level of government, they do interact with others like the Transportation Planning Board, of course, with the county government, with the cities and with neighboring jurisdictions as well. So the Thrive 2050 plan um, it has been about two years in the making, uh, and it's just before council. Tonight, right now, is the first public hearing on the final draft of the Thrive 2050 plan as presented to council. There will be another public hearing on July 29th, no, on June 29th, and you can still submit comments. I just got a text from Denise until July 9th. So, Ari, would you drop the link from the notes here if you haven't already? Um, where you can go and see all of ANS's past work on Thrive Mon Montgomery 2050, as well as um, um, where you can read the plan and submit your own testimony. And we really encourage you to save these links 
and check it out if you live in Montgomery County. Um, it's, it's very important that people who, you know, if you have opinions, weigh in. And to get to Stu's specific question, I hope he's still here. It looks like some, oh yeah, you're still here. Um, to get to Stu's specific question, which is about kind of what do we think about the Thrive 2050 plan and housing and how it will reduce driving. Um, we have just submitted our formal comments and Denise is testifying tonight. We think it's really important that Thrive 2050 strive for a balance in meeting the needs of incoming population. The DC region is forecast to continue to grow population. A lot of people, something like 200,000 over the coming decades um, to continue to grow out the DC region. And um, you know, where will they live is really essential. And if we don't plan for where they will live and make sure that there are affordable and attainable places for people to live, they will move to wherever we'll have them. And those will be places in our commuter, broader commuter region that don't have great controls and planning on growth, frankly. You know, they'll, so they'll end up in the outer suburban and exurban regions where they have, um, uh, you know, and chopped down forests. We've had enormous forest lost in Loudoun County and Prince William County. Frederick County has seen many, many, many more. We have seen farm loss to subdiv subdivisions. You know, those are all part of the broader commuting area of the Washington DC region. So one of the premises we take as we interact with the, our land use plans around the region is, how do we make sure that we're not sprawling out and cutting down the forests that are remaining in the outer parts of the area? It's been huge, the forest loss. I don't have a map to show you right now, but um, it's something we've we spoken about a little bit on our blog and we'll continue to do so. So it's, it is really important that the Thrive Plan tries to work on um, transit-oriented development. It's, it's going to increase some density in the places near Metro and near the bus rapid transit lines, mark stations, things like that. Um, we do see some challenges in what it's trying to get, and we, we support that. We're supporting increasing density in the transit-oriented locations. Um, we also want to protect our forests. We also want to um, not contribute additionally to stormwater management uh, problems. So the comments we're making are saying, we do support the housing element, but we also really need more emphasis on protecting some of the natural resources. And we're also trying to get at some of those policies in other ways. For example, we're trying to get the council to pass a no net loss of forest bill, which would be the regulation, the law that would say, when you do a development, you cut down trees, you have to replace them all. Um, not just some of them, which is what the law currently says, that you can have some net loss. And, um, um, and some, some other policy tools like that that we're working on. So we don't think that Thrive 2050 is perfect, but we uh, actually support the housing element and we wanna see improvements in some of the other elements as well. Um, in, including that it, within the housing element, we wanna make sure that they're not making waivers on the existing laws and regulations. Um, Stu, I hope that answered your question. We could talk a lot more about this. We'd rather not. We're actually gonna be publishing our comments soon on our blog, as well as some other information about it. So Stu, please do check out our conservation blog on Thrive 2050 for more in just the coming next few weeks. Most of ANS's members are in Montgomery County, but definitely not all. I, I guess it's a plurality um, are in Montgomery County. Uh, and then the rest spread throughout the region with big proportion in DC. So let's turn to DC, which is where indeed the next biggest cohort here tonight is from. So Ari, take it away. Thanks, Eliza. So um, as I mentioned, I'm the DC conservation advocate. So I run our DC work and um, I highly encourage you to check out Oxen Run Park, which is where I took the picture of that basketball uh, hoop and um, the backboard. It's just beautiful. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I just wanted to give a plug. Um, all right, next slide. Okay, so in DC, we're gonna be talking tonight about three main uh, campaigns slash projects slash programs that we're running. And the first is something that actually really applies even more so to Maryland and Virginia than it does in DC purely by the numbers. Um, and this is gas. And when we're talking about gas, we're talking about methane gas. And that's also sometimes called natural gas. And um, I hope if, if, if I leave you with anything tonight, I hope it is that we all can move forward in our lives using the words methane gas instead of natural gas, because although it's naturally occurring, you know, we find it in, in between rocks deep in the ground, the process of extracting it and then burning it 
is certainly not natural and contributes to a lot of harm. Um, and so we're working in DC with the DC chapter of the Sierra Club and they are working specifically with um, something called the Beyond Gas Campaign. And that's a national Sierra Club um, campaign to help transition the whole country um, away from using fossil fuels and specifically methane. And what we've been doing in terms of um, this particular you know, greenhouse gas is is, is working on this through the lens of gas leaks. Um, and I, I'm sure many of us have walked around our neighborhoods. Um, feel free to you know, raise your virtual hand or, or your real hand if you've ever smelled a gas leak, um, but they smell like rotten eggs. And um, in and of themselves, they can actually be pretty harmful. They explode. Um, DC has had many instances of exploding manholes actually. Um, because what happens is pipes crack underneath the ground and gas seeps through the ground and it pools up at the highest surface it can find because methane is lighter than air. And that is often manhole covers. And then when a car runs over manhole covers or you know, some hits the curb and a little spark um, enters the manhole cover, then you get an explosion. Um, and so that's just one reason that we, you know, that we don't like. Um, methane in our neighborhoods. But another is that when methane leaks, which it does no matter what, no matter what the pipes are made of, no matter how new they are, um, you just can't account for, you know, the movement of the ground and, you know, construction. There's always going to be leakage. But when methane enters the atmosphere, it reacts with sunlight and a bunch of other gases and uh, forms ozone and ozone when, when it's high in the atmosphere is a good thing. It helps protect us from you know, UV pollution and you know, helps us not get skin cancer. But when it's lower down in the atmosphere in what's called the troposphere, which is you know, kind of where we are, it um, turns into smog. Um, and smog is incredibly dangerous for pretty much everybody, but especially for people with pre-existing conditions like uh, heart disease and asthma. Um, and there are many places in the country where smog is a serious issue. And there have been a couple of days I've screenshotted them all on my phone when the air quality in DC is particularly bad, when it's really hot or there's a really sudden um, weather change. But that's just one component of this. And then I think probably most of us, I'm guessing, um, have a gas stove. I know I do. Um, and if you don't have a gas stove, please feel free to tell us what you use as an alternative in the chat. Um, we would love to hear your story. But um, one of the things that gas companies have been doing a really brilliant job of over the past many decades is, is putting a lid on the dangers of gas in our homes. Um, and so we're working in DC and with the Sierra Club on trying to raise awareness of the fact that when you actually burn methane um, and cook with it or use it for heating, it turns into a whole slew of really, really toxic other gases. Um, one of which is formaldehyde, we're all familiar with that. Another is carbon monoxide and the third and, and sort of most um, abundant when you, when you burn methane is nitrogen dioxide. And nitrogen dioxide is very toxic to humans. Um, and a really interesting and sort of frightening statistic for me when I learned it was that there's some new research that indicated that when, um, if for, for children who grow up in homes with a gas stove without proper ventilation, the chances of developing asthma increase up to 42%, um, which is a really frightening number. And just to be clear that improper ventilation is the norm because um, there are no building code laws that mandate proper ventilation in the US. And so, you know, every time we cook with a gas stove, we're putting ourselves at risk, we're putting our children at risk. Um, and so, you know, using a gas leak detector as we have in, in these pictures is a great way to start beginning the conversation about, you know, something that's really tangible and then bringing it to something that's a little bit more of a touchy subject because folks love their gas stoves. I grew up in a home with a gas stove. I used to think it was the, you know, the, the pinnacle of cooking. Um, and if you check out our blog, Eliza actually has posted some really great uh, information on 
how she switched her family to an induction stove for exactly this reason. Um, and so we've been walking around neighborhoods with this gas leak detector. Um, and in the, in the left picture, that's my cat, Archie. And he doesn't exactly know how to use the gas leak detector, but he's trying. So if you join us on one of our gas leak detection field events, maybe you will get to meet Archie. Uh, <laughs> but we've been going around the city um, all you really need to do is turn this detector on, stick it in the top of a manhole, and we get readings everywhere. And so we're putting together, you know, a, a community sourced database of leaks throughout the city that's going to help us make the case for the fact that we don't need to just replace every pipe under the streets. We need to transition the whole system and we need to transition low income folks first so that they don't get left paying for the entire gas grid infrastructure. So I think Eliza put in the chat, we've got um, an event coming up this Tuesday at 6.30 um, to talk in, about this issue in more detail and then a bunch of field trainings throughout DC. So please join us for one of those. Next slide. All right. And this is also something that's a cross jurisdictional issue. You know, as I'm talking about this and realizing that we, we, we end up, you know, sort of as the DC sort of had a lot of things flow into DC from <laughs> from Maryland and Virginia and then we also end up sending a lot of things outward and one of those things is is plastic bottles um, but also plastic pollution as a whole and I think you know this is one of those issues that's very visible very tangible for many of us um, and there have been a lot of efforts throughout the years in the past you know many decades to figure out a way to get rid of plastic bottle pollution. Um, and you know, one of the ways is through a bottle deposit. And I'm not sure if any of you folks grew up in either New York or California or Maine or Vermont or New Hampshire, but those states have what's called this bottle deposit where you basically, you know, five cents or so is added onto the price of every plastic bottle that you buy and then you get that back when you bring it to the grocery store. And it's a really great way to encourage recycling, but it's also a really hard thing to get done politically. And so, you know, although we're not tied to that specific legislative solution, we do want to get plastic bottles out of our waterways. It, it you know, is a very difficult thing to enjoy nature and enjoy your streams and waterways when you've got trash pollution everywhere. And this is a particularly intense issue in low-income neighborhoods in DC, um, especially east of the Anacostia. And those neighborhoods suffer from really systemic disinvestments in public health and environmental health, which means that they don't get cleaned up as much as you know places in wealthier parts of the city. And so we wanna make sure that we're fighting for a solution um, that ends up working for the whole you know, DMV that is also equitable and creates jobs and gets plastic out of our waterways um, and keeps us all safer. So there's an action alert um, if you live in DC. And I think, you, you know, honestly, if you live in Maryland too or Virginia, please, um, you know, send our, our petition. Uh, it's on the, on the blog um, because this is something that really affects, affects all of us. And we just wanna, you know, figure out what to do about it. All right, next slide. And lastly, I wanted to talk about um, one of the more recent things we've been doing in DC, which is Ward 8 Water Watchers. Um, so for folks who aren't familiar with the way that DC is organized geographically, um, it's split up into eight wards, which are basically just sort of chunks throughout the city uh, neighborhoods. And Ward 8 is at the very Southeast tip of DC um, and is about 95% black and contains some of the lowest income neighborhoods in the city. And that means that there's not as much access to green spaces, even though a lot of green spaces exist, they're often poorly maintained because the city doesn't invest in them um, or residents don't feel safe using them for a number of reasons. And this is particularly the case with a lot of the stream corridors in, in Ward 8 and also in Ward 7. And so we wanted to focus on, you know, 
creating a program, working with on the ground organizations that are already trusted in the neighborhoods in Ward 8 to find a way to make streams safe and particularly Oxen Run, which runs through Prince George's County um, and then comes into the district right in, in, in the Southeast bit and then comes back into Prince George's County and lets out at Oxen Cove. And it's absolutely gorgeous um, and has a, a really fascinating history, I think. And you can see behind me, this the, the picture I've got in my background is Oxen Run. Um, and the banks of Oxen Run in this particular stretch that runs through DC are lined with concrete. And that was something that was done back in 1978 slash 1979 by the Army Corps of Engineers um, after a bunch of really intense hurricanes to prevent flooding in the adjacent neighborhoods. And it's had some deleterious impacts on water quality and erosion. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do with Ward 8 Water Watchers is, you know, allow people to get in the stream. You know, there are a lot of folks who have felt like this isn't for them, even though they live right near it. And so we've got these yellow boots um, that we use for some of our you know, other water quality monitoring programs. And I didn't know this when we started this program, but people love putting on these yellow boots and walking in the stream. That's like the number one reason people want to participate in Ward 8 Water Watchers. So We've had a series of like family-friendly community engagement events that are based off of a project that Denise um, and um, one of our other teammates, Greg, ran in the Long Branch neighborhood of, um, I think, Montgomery County. Um, and that was such a successful program. And so we've modeled some of Ward 8 Water Watchers events after that and started to build a core of families and adults and kids, our youngest water water watcher, Ward 8 water watcher is 18 months. Um, and these are folks who live in the adjacent neighborhoods around Oxen Run and have gotten in the stream, um, learned about what lives in it, told their story of connection to the stream and are committed to stewarding it. Um, and we've been doing this work with um, some groups that are really on the ground. And by really on the ground, I mean, um, in the in the pictures on the left hand side of this slide, the the sort of wooden fence thing is the beginnings of an urban farm called the Well, and it's run by an organization called DC Greens, um, and so they've been one of our major partners um, in you know connecting us to this space, um, being a trusted and familiar face for community members in the area and the Green Scheme has also been doing that, and they're um, a food justice organization in the city as well. And so it's been just a ton of fun. You can go to the next slide. Um, got just a couple more pictures of our family events. Yeah, we had a, a cleanup. Um, we've had two cleanups so far. And one of them was in a part of the stream where the banks have remained um, naturalized. And we found you know, a whole slew of these scooters. Um, the, the scooters that you can rent from like Lime or Uber or Lyft and such. Uh, I think we found three just that one day. We found an entire pickup truck buried in the stream bank, um, a motorcycle, a whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think a like seven or eight year old found a, a, a pickaxe that was like the size of him. Um, <laughs> so it's been, yeah, it's, it's really extraordinary. Um, but it's also a lot of fun, you know, and, and helps create a sense of ownership that's been systemically denied to folks living around the stream. And is, it, is particularly important because the um, District Department of Energy and the Environment is planning a stream restoration um, and community members haven't really been included in projects like that in the past. And so we wanna make sure that Ward 8 Water Watchers participants are prepared to be able to advocate for themselves and for their stream um, when the restoration comes around. And so creating this sense of ownership is a really important precursor to, be, to being able to um, engage in that type of self-determination. Um, and that's our youngest Ward 8 Water Watcher, Nemo, on the right in the middle with that uh, trash picker up. So yeah, we have plenty of events. And if you're in the area or not, feel free to join us. Um, at Oxen Run. And um, Ari, if you want to look back through the chat, there was one question that's definitely for you, which is, 
Um, Janet Walker asked on natural gas, I had thought methane was a byproduct of natural gas, but really it is the whole product. I think yes, that's a it propaganda is. issue. Yes, <laughs> it is exactly that. Um, natural gas is about 96% methane. There's a little bit of like butane and propane in there that just kind of comes from the ground too. Um, but, you know, it's pretty safe to say that natural gas is methane. Um, so, yeah. So now we call it methane gas. Yep. Um, Why, um, I know Montgomery, somebody at ANS tried to get uh, a bottle deposit in Montgomery County um past do you remember when oh uh, five years ago or something and said it was impossible because of the soda companies and the bottlers is that the real problem here and how 100%. is new england but how is new england able to have it i mean maine you do have mm -hmm. bottle deposits yeah and massachusetts i don't know if massachusetts does but i think so i think it's like it's 10 Not states every state in, in new england but but yeah if they've been able, what did they do that we have not been able to do, I guess? They snuck <laughs> I, in. I think, yeah. I think a lot of those bills were passed early in the environmental movement with huge yeah, momentum 80s. behind them. They, were the, they, they happened at once. Yeah. And then the bottle industry went, whoa, what just happened? And they got to work lobbying so that to prevent any others from. Maybe you're right. Along. It's because it happened early. Yeah. And those yeah. are all states I that have, have an extremely strong environmental core to begin with, like California. Yeah. Well, DC is following New England in a lot of ways and a lot of things. I mean, you know, we, yeah. we banned styrofoam before a lot of uh, those states and straws. Um, so, yeah. Uh, DC's an enigma and, and, a, and a very interesting place to do environmental work. Um, especially when it comes to beverage stuff, because um, a lot of the big industry, you know, lobbying groups focus really hard on DC, because even though it's not a state, it often ends up being a precursor for a lot of other states passing environmental legislation. Um, and so they focus on making sure that stuff doesn't happen in DC so that it oh, won't happen in other places. I think our bag tax was one of the early adopters. We were one of the early adopters of the bag tax. Yeah. Yep. Or the Same with our climate tax. legislation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Northern Virginia. This is our last section that we're going to. Um, a detail on it, and then we should also wrap up with even more time for questions and discussion and we really do welcome welcome that so northern virginia as ari um said when he was talking about um, renee Grieby's work we mostly work in fairfax county on policy and advocacy issues some on loudon even a little even less of just a very small amount on prince william and then um, um we do some work on state level issues mainly but by communicating with our local state senators and representatives and as part of a coalition called the Virginia Conservation Network. And by the way, in Maryland, um, we're members of coalitions as well that have Annapolis-based people who help help us uh, leverage our membership base to be effective in Annapolis without us having to be in Annapolis, walking the halls of the General Assembly, you know, lobbying people in person. The same in Virginia, the Virginia Conservation Network is headquartered in Richmond. Uh, they have all the expertise on exactly what's going down legislatively with the bills and the negotiations, and they kind of tell us what they need from Northern Virginia, and we tell them what Northern Virginia needs um, so that they can include that when they think about their negotiations around legislation. So, um, but most of what we do is actually at the county government level. So here's our first action alert in Northern Virginia. Um, Ari, would you drop that in? This is the, the hot off the presses issue I was telling you about. So. Um, our blog post has a lot of depth on it. I'm gonna summarize at a high level. Um, if you're familiar with the Save 10 Mile Creek campaign that happened at Audubon Naturalist Society from about 2010 to 2014, along with many of our allies, um, raise your hand or say something in the chat. Or um, who, who, who here remembers that? Yeah, Janet, I bet many, I bet a number of the others do as well. Um, so the reason that was such a big, big deal First of all, it was a very undeveloped, lightly developed um, 
watershed part of Montgomery County in the mostly in the agricultural reserve, although not fully. And um, so there were a lot of farms, a lot of forests, a lot of nature remaining there. And uh, the master plan allowed for a significant amount of new development around Clark's Clarksville. Um, and the, but, but what we knew is that the, the watershed, the 10 Mile Creek watershed feeds Little Seneca Reservoir, which is a dam reservoir on the 10 Mile Creek stream. And that reservoir, Little Seneca Reservoir is one of the backup emergency drinking water sources for the entire Washington DC region. Meaning if there's a spill lower down in the Potomac that affects the drinking water intakes that we get our drinking water from, no matter where we are, if your water provider is WSSC, Fairfax Water, DC Water, they all take water in off the Potomac as their primary source. And so if there's a spill on the Potomac, they need to get water from somewhere else. And we don't actually have pipes or if there's a drought. So if we don't actually have pipes, but what we do is we can release extra water from the Little Seneca Reservoir. And then after the contaminated plume has passed the other reservoirs, there's like more clean water available. It's complicated. It has both pipes and math involved. Um, but it, but that's, but that's why it was such a big deal, and that's ultimately why we were successful because it was a region-wide campaign to protect the emergency backup drinking water supply. So the Occoquan Reservoir in Fairfax County is another reservoir that serves a similar purpose for regional backup supply. Uh, it's managed more directly by uh, by Fairfax County, and Fairfax Water is the water authority that that uses it. And just like the Little Seneca Reservoir, it's surrounded by quite low density. It's called RC zone. Um, that's, that have large lots, relatively small paved areas and buildings. And the remaining farms in Fairfax County are almost all on this RC uh, zone type. And a, an issue before the Board of Supervisors, like now, uh, next week is the hearing. Um, it's really important, to, is, especially if you live in Fairfax County, but not only, if you live elsewhere, this is important to you because of the drinking water issue. Um, it's important for the whole region. And it's our most recent alert that just went up yesterday. And the hearing is, um, I'm checking the exact date so that you know, because the, your letters need to be in before June 22nd, before Tuesday at 4.30. We need your letters in. So check that link, go to the action alert. You can also go in person and testify um, on the phone or on Zoom and tell them that we need to protect our backup drinking water supply. The threat is that they would allow more by right agritourism activities in the RC and a couple of other similarly low density zoned areas. And that's not a big deal if you wanna do a pumpkin patch, you know, and all autumn long people are coming in and out of the pumpkin patch. And yes, you allow parking on one of your grass fields, but then after autumn, it's not gonna be for parking anymore. You're not gonna pave it. And um, you have a sort of flow of people in and out over the course of the day. What we're worried about is weddings, corporate events, other single use, really high density, high impact events that, in, that are more formal. So you might need to pave so that you have a place that people are getting out in high heels, feel comfortable stepping onto. Um, you need to accommodate the sewage flow and cooking infrastructure, uh, you know, grease traps and things for a ton of people arriving all at once, having a lot of needs and then leaving. Uh, so all of those things could really lead to a lot more impacts on forests and farmlands, turning them over into various kinds of paved or compacted surfaces um, that we're worried about. Uh, it's something that, yes, even if you're not a Virginia resident, Jennifer, you can address that drinking water issue uh, because the Occoquan is part of this region-wide backup drinking water system that we have. And you can use our blog to comment about that. So it's it's not as, let me say that it's not like the 10 Mile Creek Camp, which was which was and going to and did allow significant suburban development. It's not that level of intensity, but we don't know where it will go, right? So if you allow by right development for agritourism, who knows what they'll start to claim for, oh, this is also agritourism, this is also agritourism. And it kind of opens up an area that is just at the cusp of the amount of impervious surface that's safe for a drinking water watershed. We don't wanna cross that threshold. We wanna keep that drinking water clean. Um, definitely, the blog is a little long, but it has all these details, um, Jennifer. It does, we definitely do not want to object to agritourism um, overall. We want sustainable agritourism, exactly. And, the, and it's very important. It has to do with the, the type and the character of events because that drives how much parking, pavement, sewage needs and things that they have. Yeah, there's lots and lots and lots of farm-based agritourism activities that we have no concerns about. 
for very limited concerns. And you can you can see that in the blog post. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions on this one? Send your letters, sign your petitions. We're so happy you're here. Join us. Our power comes from y'all. I want to be very clear about that. All of these action alerts, it's very important that you take action with us when you get those emails. Um, do they listen to us? Yeah, they may, they, because we know what we're talking about and because we have members who we can activate. And then they do really listen to members. And it's very great when you write something in a letter form. We put the letter form together so that you don't have to go researching you know, people's email addresses and how to do the comment forms. But when you put in your own words, it's so much more powerful than just copying ours. And that's why actually one of the things that ANS does not do is give you template letters. We give you ideas for talking points and then we leave the form blank and we want you to fill it in with your own words. Even if you don't use any of our talking points, if you just say, I care about this and here's why, that is so valuable because you are a real person, a real constituent and um, you know they have, to, they have to listen to you. Um, and yes, Jennifer, if there's, you know, Virginia has a local wine industry, local wine tastings, um, no problem, uh, a winery where, you know, you're serving people on premises and they're coming in and out as a recreational activity, no problem. But does that winery also become a wedding venue? Does that winery also throw corporate events? That's becomes the, that becomes the, the question. That, that's what I was wondering about, because a lot of wineries do that. Yeah. So you have to refine it. Right, and uh, what we're gonna ask for is not that we don't allow any changes in the agritourism, but they need to think this through a little more. So one of the things you can do is ask for, instead of having it be by right, we can have it be a special exception. Um, so that what, what now is going forward is a by right plan, which would mean, yes, we wanna do weddings, so we're gonna be able to just do it. Instead, what we want them to be able to say is, I've got my winery, I've been developing this great business where people come in on the weekends and we do a little bit of music and it's all low key. I'd like to be able to do weddings. I need a little more cash flow. They come before the zoning commission and they ask for the exception. And the zoning commission says, okay, how many of your neighbors have already done this? How many parking lots are in the watershed? Uh, you know, what's the impact overall and how do you mitigate it? Let's make a plan specific to your property rather than just, yep, you don't even have to ask is what, is what it would be under this proposal. Yeah, that is a difficult ask, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next in Fairfax County, ready? Ooh, this is fun. Okay. Getting Route 1 right. Now we're going to go from the rural to the much closer to urban. Who has driven along the Route 1 corridor? How awful is that, right? It's like, ugh. I mean, ages ago. I haven't done it recently. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like this picture on the right here. Let me just be clear. It's, uh, uh, it's like eight lanes of no trees. And on the sides are big giant strip malls with big giant parking lots. It's just a pavement, you know, disaster. It's also a vibrant, thriving, um, largely immigrant community. There's historically black neighborhoods there that stretch back to um, enslaved people who were freed from Mount Vernon estate by George and Martha Washington. Um, it's a really culturally rich area, but it's built environment is just awful. And, um, and so the county has targeted it as a place to um, redevelop and revitalize. And the entire Route 1 corridor between um, the Huntington Metro at Alexandria and all the way down towards the edge of Fort Belvoir is what's now called the Embark Corridor, which uh, Richmond Highway. And uh, they want to um, really redevelop the public space, which will generate by adding bus rapid transit and, and sit, laying the groundwork for there to be metro extension one day past Huntington. Uh, and, and by doing so, which they've already begun doing, and the Virginia Department of Transportation has already begun doing the planning for the bus rapid transit, um, there's incentives for developers to come in, gather parcels together, and they're going to really add a lot more residential and commercial density. So they'll bring down, you know, the streetscape should look really different, less of those big gigantic surface parking lots, maybe more underground or garage parking under top larger buildings. Uh, and maybe less parking overall because they'll be more reliant on the bus rapid transit. So those are all really, really great things. It's great for, I'm gonna, it's, I'm gonna skip ahead. It's great for, this is what it looks like right now. It's gonna be great for stormwater. All of this stuff is pre any stormwater management. It just whooshes into the creeks nearby like Little Hunting Creek, which is considered the crashiest creek in Fairfax County and, and parts of it are in a channel like this. 
and you can see how much trash this band along the trash track catches. Um, so it's, it's just really hammered by all this pavement. And there's a huge opportunity when we redevelop these parking lots and things to bring them up to modern stormwater standards, which means that it will catch and retain that stormwater before it hits directly into the stream. Um, all great things for, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for the environment here to improve. And there's also a lot of opportunity to put more people without cutting down a single tree because there's no trees to cut down. <laughs> uh, here's where we can put, imagine how many people, you, if you built, you know, a seven story mid-rise building on this laundromat, you know, here, you wouldn't have to, you could keep those trees in the back and you could house a hundred people here where currently there is, uh, you know, there's just this parking and a couple of small businesses. And the small businesses, of course, can stay as ground floor retail. But, so, so this is what it could look like, right? Look from that to that, how nice, you know. But there are problems. Um, and I'm gonna to talk to you about how, some of the ways in which ANS has addressed some of those problems. And one of the problems is that the housing that's currently there, a lot of it is in not so great shape and it's relatively affordable. It actually has mobile home communities um, in which, uh, some immigrant communities, African-American communities, uh, low-income communities of a variety of um, uh, racial backgrounds. It's one of the most diverse parts of Fairfax County and one of the poorest, but they may own their mobile homes, but not the ground under them. That's how mobile home parks work, which means they're very vulnerable to having the property sold and redeveloped if it gets rezoned. And, um, and they're very scared that housing costs are gonna go up, both for the people in the mobile home communities, people who already live, in the smaller multifamily buildings, people who rent houses, um, because even though there's a great need for housing, they're already crammed together and overcrowded there um, be, to be able to afford to stay in the Fairfax County school system. So even though there's this great need for more housing, new housing is almost always, no matter what, gonna be a little more expensive than older housing that's not in good shape, unless you have a big investment of public dollars to make it publicly subsidized affordable housing. So that's an important component. There are some of those buildings, but nonetheless, the areas is, housing prices have already started going up. So people are very concerned. Another concern they have is just their access to their resources and amenities that they've always had. So here's a story I'm gonna tell you about coalitions on Richmond Highway. What you're looking at right now is a neighborhood called Gum Springs. This is the African-American neighborhood I was telling you about that was founded by people who were freed from the Mount Vernon plantation. Um, it originated here as a farm right next to Mount Vernon. Um, this is one of the historic founders, West Ford. Uh, there's still a street, West Ford Street there. And there's a Gum Springs Community Association that's sort of small but mighty. And a number, a couple hundred descendants of the original families still live there, still know each other, are related to one another, are very tight knit. Um, it's a very closely linked community. And it's right there. It's like, this is it. Richmond Highway is right behind the Paisanos, you know? Um, uh, you can't there's you can see the gum springs there's a church that you can see on fortson road if you drive by that, that and so fortson road is sort of the entrance to the community and it's very very important as you can imagine to the community members to maintain this sense of community this access to one another this access to their public spaces and to resources and not to be gentrified out and fragmented um, and so one of the things that VDOT, the virginia department of transportation was considering as they planned the bus rapid transit was to get rid of this um, southbound left turn lane, left turn ability. They were planning on, as you can see here, removing the existing signal that is there that allows you to turn left when you're headed um, when you're headed this way. And this is their main entrance, you know. So the community there were very upset, and they were going to get ready to, you know, get in touch with Scott Sturbel, all their Senator Scott Sturbel, all the board of supervisor representatives, you know, and and be very mad and oppose the whole plan because they're going to feel cut, you know, cut, completely cut off from their neighborhood and their ability to get in and out during their commutes. Um, we had previous relationships with some of the leadership of the Citizens Association there. Um, through our, we've, been, we've been doing listening sessions and joining community groups along the Route 1 corridor for years now. So we knew some of the leadership in Gum Springs Civic Association. And we reached out and we said, what can we do here? You know, what do we need? And they said, we, we, need, we want our traffic signal. You know, yes, it might slow the bus rapid transit thing down by 20 seconds, but we want that traffic signal so we can turn left to get home. We're coming back from, you know, from Alexandria and from DC. And so we reached out to a coalition that we've been working with on the Route 1 corridor for years, Coalition for Smarter Growth, um, the Audubon Society of Northern Virginia, the Coalition for Better Bicycling, Fairfax Alliance for Better Bicycling, um, Friends of Little Hunting Creek, um, a wide variety of different, mostly environmental oriented organizations that are supporting different elements of this plan. 
especially the transit parts, the biking parts. And we said, we've got to support Gum Springs on this. We brought them together. And so um, we were able to, and I don't have the next slide here to show you, but we were able to work with BDOT to get them to keep that traffic light in there. And what's one traffic light, right, in a 10 mile long plan to revitalize a huge swath of Fairfax County? It's a small part, but it's a very important part. And Gum Springs sits along Little Hunting Creek. They had other concerns. They were worried that the bike path. Good question. Just yeah. before you go on, you know, along Route 50 in Arlington County, they have side roads that go into neighborhoods. Was that a possibility here? I don't know. Um, there already are some service roads along different parts of, of um, Route 1. Um, but, really but, you know, if I just look at this map, it looks like they're uh, not here. Yeah, along 50, they really help to isolate those neighborhoods mm -hmm. so much from the heavy traffic. It, it's extra space. It really sets some, you've probably seen them on Route 50. Yeah. And uh, well, anyway, go ahead. I didn't, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, I know, what you, I know what you're talking about. I don't know if or why that might've been, might have been or not been an option here. That's not what I'm familiar with. I do know that they were really upset about this traffic light. <laughs> um, um, so, but that's just one example. You know, it might've looked different if there were service lanes, it might've looked, it might look different in another community. Um, but it's one example of how this is a good thing for transportation. It's a good thing for climate. It's a, overall a good thing for the region's immense housing needs, but not everybody is a winner in any change like this. And we need to be really aware of that when we're working on these, these environmental and land use matters and connect with the communities who have fears, um, mostly their justified fears, you know, and see if we can work with them to help because we wanna gain those environmental benefits, but we don't wanna do it at the loss of people and, Especially, if we don't. One of the things we want to be careful of is if we, if it gets too expensive to live here, it's not just that higher income people might move further out and chop down trees. Lower income people also might end up having to move further out and have trees chopped down for their houses. But then they're just stuck. You know, then how are they going to commute? How are they going to deal with gas prices? What if there's no buses that go that way? So there's um, there's a there's there's really complicated set of social issues that go around any environmental issue and we have to deal with it because we're in an urban and suburban space. We're not protecting wilderness here. You know, we're protecting parklets and stream valleys that wind through neighborhoods and we need to be aware of how they interact with their human neighbors. So that we're gonna leave the rest of the time for questions and then just close up in the last two minutes. So we have about, we have about seven more minutes for questions. I have a question. I don't know if you have the answer for it, but I was just today I heard this thing of how we were talking about the agro-tourism being a buy right um, situation that like I think it, this is in Virginia, but they're like increasingly like environmental laws where they're trying to encourage like renewable energy. There might be like laws that um, prohibit like local communities from um, doing like a special exception for like solar panels, for example. Um, I don't know if that's in place or like that's being talked about, but is there like a an similar implication to the agro-tourism where they're concerned that that might open up the floodgates in like rural areas? So like in rural counties, if everyone can do by right social or social solar panels, does, is that gonna open us up to a loss of forests down the road? Is that something that's, on your radar, if you've heard about. Or you want to start? Go for it. OK. Um, yes, it's on our radar. The reason I tried to throw it to Ari is because one of the very first things he worked on was fighting a solar project in a forest on, uh, in Charles County, actually, on the Nanjimoy Peninsula that was contracted by Georgetown University, um, the Origis Solar Farm. and. This has come up really explicitly in Montgomery County in the Agricultural Reserve, um, where some of the county, county council members um, passed, got proposed a zoning amendment that would allow, um, open up more of the Agricultural Reserve to solar panels. Currently, farmers are allowed to have them for their own use, um, but not for commercial, not to sell um, significantly extra to the grid. And the Montgomery Countryside Alliance was very concerned that it would be a more, basically a more lucrative use of farmland than farming. And they really want farming, farmland to stay for farming. And forestry, there's also a lot of forests in the Ag Reserve. That's the primary purpose of it. 
Um, so it was a it was a big fight. ANS engaged uh, somewhat um, to express some concerns we had with the proposal. Um, we were definitely not a leading fight, but a, a leader in the in the fight in opposition. But we didn't support the proposal. You know, we felt like it's not that there are no places for solar in any in agricultural areas. There definitely are, um, but we feel it needs to be done through a comprehensive planning process. You got to ID, you know, screen out the conflicts and ID where where the right places to put them um, at a regional scale. And put them on buildings first. Put them on parking lots. You know, that's what we want to see. Thanks, Christian. Yeah. Thank you. And you guys can see recordings of all of our past virtual conservation cafes because we didn't used to record them um, online. So, and let me add: if any of this is interesting to you, and you're like, I would really like to get more involved, some of us, some of you. Joan and Anne in particular have volunteered doing conservation advocacy work with us. And um, uh, I should mention that Anne actually served on the task force that helped develop our new conservation priorities. And um, uh, we're, 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 I won't say always because it sometimes it's a little hard to onboard, but if you are interested in helping us research and advocate on issues like these, if this just sounded like really, really, really fascinating to you and you want to do, learn more and do more and read and write about it, please let us know. And we will find a way to onboard you and get you involved in some of these issues to help support us and, and help lend your you know, analyses and opinions to, to what we decide to do. Thanks everybody. Okay, thanks. Thanks all. Have a great night.